from Wentworth Institute of Technology in Boston. Welcome to Inside Wentworth. Hello, and thanks for joining us. My name is Dennis Nealon, and I'm the host for this episode and the Associate Director for Public Relations and Marketing at Wentworth Institute of Technology. The goal of this podcast series is to share some of the exciting things happening at Wentworth and, more broadly, to highlight the real stuff of higher education, the important courses, programs, people, trends, and events that typically don't get covered in the mainstream media. Today, we're going to be speaking with acclaimed poet Richard Blanco, who in the summer of 2016 was a guest instructor at Wentworth, part of a team of professors offering a new humanities-based course called The Human Engineer. We caught up with him on his way to class to ask him about his work and get his perspective as a poet and a writer on the historic spike in violence in the United States in the summer of 2016. Before we get to our discussion, though, let me share some background with you. Richard Blanco is a civil engineer turned poet who has used his popular writing style to probe the human spirit and explore his Cuban roots. Some of his most recent work has focused on the June 12th mass shooting in a nightclub in Orlando, Florida, a community that Richard knows very well. When he was chosen by President Obama as the fifth inaugural poet in U.S. history, Richard became the youngest person, the first Latino, the first immigrant, and first openly gay person to serve in that role. For that swearing-in ceremony in 2013, Richard composed and recited a work titled One Today, which he discusses with us here today, and which you can find, along with his other works, on Richard's website at richard-blanco.com. Hello, Richard, and thank you for joining us. With your work and your background in mind, tell us what's wrong with our culture today, a culture that in the summer of 2016 was rocked by an unprecedented wave of violence. The question is, how can we attempt to understand what's been going on in our country and put it in some kind of perspective? Well, getting back to the inaugural poem of one today, mm -hmm. um, one could say it's optimistic, but it's also, in a way, saying we're not one today. <laughs> okay. um, and the last few lines are sort of acknowledge that uh, that uh, hope uh, is waiting for us to map it and waiting for us to name it together. And so, in part, even in that poem, there's a little bit of tension about the idea that in a sense the poem is recognizing that we are one today because we all need to function and work together and we're all interconnected in, a, in very significant ways but that we're not always we don't always acknowledge that or respect that so right. so that's part of the tension in that poem um, I think what we're seeing today is of course something that what we always see is the tip of the iceberg is something that goes back in history a long long way and I think what we're trying to what we're seeing in a way is the result of several historical variables and, well, just history in general. So um, one is, of course, our unresolved uh, racism in this country and uh, extend that racism to, you know, anti-immigration, extend it to anti-ethnic, anti-everything, which is, I think, something that sort of has been building over time for us, mm -hmm. uh, something that was not quite resolved. Um, and I think that's part of what's going on. The other piece of that um, is, for me, is a very broken political system. I think this two-party system that we've had for decades, going back to the Southern Democrats and that whole switcheroony and, and everything that's happened, and I think, in a way, that's part of what is happening is that these things... I mean, I've been hearing about gun, gun control and gun regulation since I was a kid, and I've been hearing about immigration since I was a kid, I've been hearing about the Middle East since I was a kid. And, and I'm not that young, <laughs> 48 now. So, you know, I think there's a, there's a system that's broken um, in terms of the politics. And I think what we're saying is that uh, a broken system can't fix anything yeah. um, and a reluctance to sort of meet at the table. And so what I'm trying to do, what a poet always tries to do and what an artist tries to do is sort of... Uh, 
sort of scratch deeper under the surface uh, than just sort of the expected answers or the expected emotions. And um, tr- that's what I'm trying to do at some of my work now is to give it some kind of um, some kind of historical grounding, some kind of understanding where these problems come from from a deeper and a deeper way. You did some work uh, related to what happened at Orlando. Mm-hmm. Um, can you describe that uh, and what that entailed? Uh, and that poem was obviously what happened in Orlando was close to me for several reasons. Um, one, uh, I grew up in Miami, so Orlando is my backyard, and I've been to Orlando like been to Disney World about seventy nine times. So, <laughs> uh, so, um, so that is, feels like home. The other thing is, uh, most of the, uh, if not all, the victims and all the families were Latino. Uh, so that also brought it home. And then, of course, being uh, LGBT, which is part of my community. Uh, so I felt moved to write a poem. Um, and um, getting back to um, sort of your first question, in a way. With that poem and a couple others that I've worked on about racism and whatnot, I have been moving in a direction that sort of where the poem becomes much more overt in exposing um, what's going on um, and exposing and feeling and being angry. However, I think what a poet, what I try to do in that poem, what I try to do in one today, what I try to do in every poem, whether it's political or about a social justice issue, is that to offer at least a ray of hope, um, at least a way out because if we don't have that, we don't have anything. And if we just continue with hate and hate plus more hate just equals hate and the ping-ponging back and forth, that's going to get anywhere. And I think uh, I think that's what I'm trying to do with my work is dig a little deeper and see how we can talk about this in a way that's uh, more than just, you know, lobbing the ball back um, and, and just staying in anger or just staying in sorrow. Um, I mean, the last thing we have is hope. Um, and I think if you look at all our all our spiritual leaders and all our civic leaders, um, Mahatmas Gandhi or Martin Luther King, you realize that they always acted out of love and compassion, with anger, but with love and compassion, um, with this kind of spiritual, a spiritual kind of confidence, um, and that that someone that people would recognize their humanity in each other and recognizing one's humanity um, I think that's what a poem tries to do is to turn abstract issues into real faces and names and lives that opens up a different a different conversation um, and there's um, you know there's not a lot of uh, that kind of talk in our country and and a lot of it is media and and again driven by media and politics where things are not people are not people they're just names and they're not even names they're just representational stuff True. you know and issues just keep on floating and floating and floating but I think the people of the world I think the people of the United States can have that conversation I think it's a little occluded right now but that's the only way anything has ever really been soft in the history of humanity right <laughs> when people talk. <laughs> we could argue, uh, I think, pretty safely that art has always, has oftentimes been a catalyst in, in helping uh, bring the issues, uh, you know, more to the forefront for average people. Uh, now, you know, I'm thinking in terms of sermons, speeches, the written word, the spoken word. Mm-hmm. Is, is that still something that can occur today? Do you think that in the role of art, I'm, I'm talking about specifically the role of art and specifically sure. maybe the role of poetry and the, of writing, can that still you know, make change, you know, help to bring about change in, in America? I think so. I think um, not necessarily directly in the ways that one might think, but art, again, gives us a way of, gives people a different way of thinking about something, mm-hmm. gives them a way out, gives them another perspective, um, gives them a deeper perspective. Um, I certainly hope so, so, hope so. if not, um, I'm not sure why I would do what I do. <laughs> right, right. So you have to uh, you go back again to the to the to hope, which is which is uh, I think what the, you know what art art what art can right. color out color out fill in colors uh, right. for right. us in that respect. What about in terms of teaching? You're working with uh, you know students at, at Wentworth now. Uh, how does what's going on in the country? 
coupled with your work in general, how does that translate into your teaching and, and, well, what, and what you're trying to impart on, on the engineering students here? I get a sense of uh, a sense of a lack of history, for example, which is just lands us back in the same boat or doesn't let us resolve the issues that we once may have started to resolve uh, talking specifically about the civil rights movement um, I think the humanities in general people often ask you know well, what's the point of the humanities or what's the point of a poem I was like well you're right there's absolutely nothing practical about art unless you consider becoming a more aware fulfilled human being practical um and yeah, there's nothing practical. Don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> and the fact is that a that a more aware, a more fulfilled, a more educated human being in the ways of humanity uh, will make a better doctor, a lawyer, or engineer, or citizen, or mother, or nurse, or bus driver, or. <laughs> yeah. And so I think you know, there's a parallel there. I think part of part of why uh, why a mouth like Trump can say what he says and get away with it is because nobody has a sense of what the real history of what we're talking about. Um, nobody seems America has an incredible anti-intellectual streak and it comes from our sort of pioneer and revolutionary spirit as if to be smart or is not important or, or, or you know, it's almost shunned upon. Uh, and I think... I think that's part of what happens. I think that's part of what's happening in this country. It's that <clears throat> that we we're not valuing, in a sense, um, what the what the humanities do for us um, from the very name of the whole field of human uh, to understand who we are and our place in this world, past, present, and future. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I am trying to do. Um, in this course, um, in part, in part uh, to enlighten engineers to realize that my own experience from engineering school was that those things had nothing to do with my job. And the reality is they have everything to do with your job, even on a very practical level. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the humanities. And in social terms of the humanities, uh, economics, social sciences, psychology. Right. So uh, it's not just nuts and bolts and no, building I'm, something, right. thinking about how do um, I you know, solve this building. Not even on the beauty before it even gets to the solving the building issue. Yeah. Uh, sometimes projects, at least in the civil engineering field, sometimes projects will take three years of community meetings before you ever before you ever start a plan. Um, I know they're all just concepts and drawings, but it takes it takes a meeting of people and community building. It takes um, sharing of ideas, team building. It takes understanding regional and local history. It takes understanding psychology of groups. <laughs> Uh, all these skills that no calculus course is ever going to give you um, and not only they're essential to your job actually and I would say even more essential than something like calculus like multivariable calculus uh, I'm not denying that the sciences and physics and math and all this stuff are not important because they do teach us a way to think but in general from what I've seen the engineering education is lopsided and not only is it lopsided but it's also I think sending out students in the world without any kind of recognition that this other stuff is not just to cram humanities down their throats so they can be well-rounded individuals mm. that's poppycock yeah there's actually a real reason for this for you to know this stuff in your job there's a real application of it in your job um you know I can give you like a thousand examples from my own from my own 20 years as working as an engineer um, but you know that kind of cultural literacy that kind of understanding understanding how humans work mm -hmm. and understanding that your end user is a human being and that just because design is the design is right doesn't mean it's the right design mm -hmm. <laughs> almost like there's too much of that same old that the best thing is success that all you need to do is succeed and we're sort of we seem to, as a culture, uh, focus more on that, that that everything's a business, you know, and that you succeed when you, you know, when the uh, the uh, 
black outweighs the red, and you're making money, and, and uh, so well, that, that also feeds into the sort of you know. Uh, well, yeah, again, feeling that's an anti-intellectualism, like, yeah. so that these right. things are not important because they're not something you put a, a, a dollar sign, a dollar sign yeah. on mm-hmm. or a price tag on. Mm-hmm. And reality is the that most successful engineering firms do. Um, they understand that the most successful projects are the ones that take into account the whole the whole spectrum and panorama of what a design project really involves. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of that, again, includes the humanities. But yeah, it's not, uh, there's this sense that um, that design happens in a vacuum and right. that uh, and that's it, and it doesn't. And like nothing, like everything else, like every human endeavor, nothing happens in a vacuum. You need at least 12 different disciplines to pull anything off. Mm-hmm. And engineering is no different. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a serious failure of at least recognizing that. Um, I can tell you when the engineering graduates would walk into our office, we would run away from them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because on the one hand, in a sense, they were taught nothing practical in the sense of they didn't know how to design anything. <laughs> on the one hand. On the other hand, they could make a phone call or write a letter. So it was like... Oh boy, we have to start the deprogramming here. The reality, be the the bearer of bad news, and start breaking down what what a job in consulting really means. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, and and just the idea also besides all that um, that we can. So it's just obvious that most of the great world's great innovations and innovators have been as a result of synthesis of knowledge of some seemingly disparate pieces of information and of knowledge that suddenly come together in a new way and create something amazing. Uh, an obvious example is like the Macs, Macs and iPhones, right. which are clearly informed by aesthetics, by, uh, by the humanities, by the sense of interaction between a human being and a machine, and they made the machine more human and sort of, and it's, you know, it's, it's a work of art, right? Yeah. It took, it took, it's, it's, designed, it's, 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 it's designed to, with psychology in mind, mm-hmm. to connect with people in a different way, in a way that seems personal, to the point that it's almost scary um, but you could have the same information you could have the same operating system and the same stuff and just not have that package and it would just be nothing that exciting so um, yeah. and back to sort of the, the current state of affairs uh, if you will uh, you talk a lot about or you, you really your work seems to reflect a lot of thinking about the human spirit if we can if we can actually uh, uh, picture what that is. It's a very broad subject, broad meaning, and a personal meaning probably to to a lot of people. But is the is the human spirit now uh, in what we're seeing in the current events? Is the human spirit broken? And and what what can we do? What can uh, what should we do to try and to try and fix it? I mean, I, I mean, I can't speak for all of 325 million people <laughs> remaining in the United right. States. Uh, I think, um, I think these are tests. I think they're obviously for the people that are most affected. It, it, it you know, it, it's even more affecting. Um, I, this isn't the first time in the history of humanity where someone's spirit has been broken. Um, I believe that Fair humans enough. are incredibly incredibly resilient people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that human beings have an incredible capacity for loss, which is what makes us amazing and incredible resilience for loss and an incredible ability to make something good out of it. Um, and I think it's the only, it's the natural reaction. Uh, one cannot stay broken spirited. Um, it's just not, it's just not a plausible, healthy place to stay. And, and most people will not. They have to find some kind of meaning, some kind of hope, some kind of change. I think what we're probably going to see is actually people stopping, stop talking a lot of BS and actually doing something um, because in that sense yeah it's enough and so you know enough pressing like on Facebook because that really does nothing other than 
create buzz and whatnot and does, does nothing. Um, uh, commit yourself to something, to some kind of organization. Commit yourself to calling a senator or a representative. Commit yourself to um, supporting something, not just with your dollars, but with your mind and your and your spirit and your energy. And I think that's, I, I've talked to a couple of people and, the, and that's it. You know, they're tired of talking about this. They're tired of waiting for the politicians to fix it, which they won't. Um, and um, they're just, you know, in a sense, nothing, in the very Zen sense, nothing ever is 100% bad or nothing is 100% good. <laughs> because out of every bad, something good comes, and out of every good, something bad will happen. <laughs> um, so nothing's perfect. Right. So I think, you know, in some senses, uh, we're going through an incredible sort of inventory uh, in this country of who we are and um, you can just sort of see in the polar spectrum of a candidate like Bernie Sanders and a candidate like Donald Trump uh, that says a lot that says a lot about who who uh, how confused we are um, and uh, how much we need to sort of get grounded back into what this country and decide as a people what are we and what do we stand for um, and what does that mean and I mean I'm sorry to say but I think it'll probably get worse before it gets better um, um, they're thinking the time is right for some kind of Counterculture or cultural revolution because uh, it's really getting polarized and it's really it's really a break almost the beginning of a breaking point. I would hope. Yeah. I think you know we've <laughs> we've we've got to we've got to get over this hurdle and decide who we are as a country and if we're really going to live up to those going to pursue those ideals as they are written, not interpreted as they are written in the Constitution. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Inside Went Earth. To learn more about Went Earth and read our latest news and feature stories, visit us online at www.wit.edu.